So let, let me begin then by uh, asking uh, how we measure equality. Um, it, this is uh, one of my, it's not the most recent book, but it's a recent book that I wrote. It's called In Pursuit of Equity. Uh, it's a book actually I thought about giving to you all and then decided that Bread Givers was so much more fun that you would actually, you might actually read Bread Givers and introduce it to your students. Whereas this one will provide you lots of information and you might want to go off to the library or somewhere and pick up a copy if you want background. But you notice that the title is not in pursuit of equality, it's in pursuit of equity. Equity meaning fairness or justice as opposed to equality. And I chose that title deliberately because equality is a problematic concept and it's more problematic perhaps when we're thinking about gender issues than it is when we're thinking about race issues or class issues or ethnicity issues. And that's because we live in something we call a gender system. Now I'm going to back up again and get to the gender system in another way. We live in a complicated urban technological deindustrializing society, as you know. And all of us participate in one way or the other in the institutions that our society creates, in educational institutions, in political institutions, uh, in the workplace, in one form or another, in families, you know, in all of those places. Uh, there are, um, uh, I would say, opportunities to participate, but also barriers to participation. Some of those barriers are visible, and others of those barriers are invisible. Historically, the ways in which society organizes itself has created those rules of visibility and invisibility. So, uh, you know, in a, in a uh, slave society, I gather you didn't talk about 19th century women yesterday, so I'm going to throw a few in here, just a little bit here and there. Uh, you know, if we talk about uh, slave families, uh, we don't have a sense of participation in our heads when we talk about them because those families were refused participation in any of the major institutions of society and assigned roles. Questions of equality don't arise. But suppose you were talking about 19th century education. And suppose in 19th century schools, we imagine, well, you know, everybody is entitled to participate in the society. Black people, white people, boys, girls, immigrants, non-immigrants, and so on. Would our goal then be to create equal participation, equal access to education? Well, now you might answer that question, yes. But in the 19th century, would you, could you answer that question, yes? No. Because the kind of education that women were expected to have and the kind of education that men were expected to have differed beyond a certain point. And the kind of education that was designated by race differed as it did by class. If you were a rich white person, particularly a rich white male person, you were channeled into certain kinds of education. If you were a poor black person or a poor white person or a poor immigrant person, you were channeled into other forms of education. So participation 
becomes the measure of equality, if you like. But how you participate and where you participate in what institutions may or may not be equal. Does inequality always equal unfairness? Or does equality equal fairness? That's the question I want to put in the back of your head. And now I want to step back yet again. By definition, some people, some of the time, have been unequal. That's how society functions. Functions in terms of the abrasive, is that a question? No, that was just a head scratching. Uh, it functions in terms of, of uh, the abrasive interactions of different people with each other so that the interrelationships of people move people either forward or push them backward. By this definition, various criteria have been barriers to equality. Sometimes race, frequently class, I should say frequently race, often ethnicity, Think of the 19th century Irish, for example, or the swarthy immigrants, Italian, Jewish, of the early 20th century. All of these have been barriers to equality. So too has gender. Now, by this I, I don't mean that um, individual women, just like individual other people, have not sometimes managed to struggle and aspire to this thing that we call equality. And sometimes because they've been lucky or because they've been persistent or because they have family backgrounds of one kind or another, they have in fact been successful in doing so. By this I mean that inequality is shaped, or equality if you like, is shaped by what I called a little while ago the gender system. Take a look at what do we mean by a gender system. Uh, briefly, you could define it as a system uh, uh, in which um, uh, uh, a set of, let me see if I can put this clearly, a set of named and unnamed, uh, so not always conscious, uh, customs, rules, ideas, habits govern how we think about the world around us. They govern our expectations, our norms, and our behaviors. Now, I pull back just a minute here because I'm conscious that I come from a generation, now this is the historical piece of me speaking, I come from a generation in which that statement would have been self-evident to everybody in the room. And looking around the room, I can see the people who have gray hairs like me nodding their heads, but the people who don't have gray hairs saying, what on earth is she talking about? You know, there are no gender rules. Well, let's see if we can sort of shake that certainty a little bit. When I grew up, I'm not that old, I'm a little bit old, but not that old, uh, but, when, but I have kids approximately your ages or some of your ages, they're in their 40s, all of them, and one is about to turn 50, so uh, that tells you something about how old I am. Um, but when I grew up in my generation, the generation of your parents and grandparents, it was self-evident that gender would not determine, but influence how people acted and what they expected. And that question of expectations is particularly important. That is, we understood in those days that we, women, would be trained for you know, marriage, family, children, household duties, and so on. 
we would also, if we were of a certain class, be trained uh, into certain occupations, occupations that were compatible with marriage, family, children. Teaching was one of them. We understood that if we were lucky, we would be not only trained for those occupations, but that we would also absorb a little education that would make us good companions to the people we were married to. So the executive wife had to know how to not only make a good dinner, but to make good conversation. Gender roles, gender expectations. Now, in this generation, I have three daughters, six grandchildren, three daughters, all of whom have different kinds of roles and shapes. Uh, nobody, nobody admits to gender roles, right? I bet if I asked you, right, do you think men and women should be treated differently in the household? You would quickly shake your heads like this. You would, anybody would say this, yes? Nobody? <laughs> All right, I won't. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So y you can see that although we now live in a world in which the ideology of gender is equality or no gender differences, right? A gender system in which men and women are treated equally. The reality of gender, and even if we're going to ask ourselves honestly, the, the desire uh, within us for particular gender roles still exists. We still understand and expect manly men, whatever that means. And it means something different now than it did 20 years ago and different than it did 50 years ago. But there's still somewhere in the back of our head a sense that men should, you fill in the gaps, should support their families should uh, not cry, uh, should uh, be tough and brave, should defend their countries. Y you can fill in the gaps. And there's still somewhere in our heads the sense that women should. Should what? Should be good mothers? Maybe. Should mother? Should have children? should marry, should, uh, if not marry, have partners, should be nurturing, should be more cooperative, you fill in the gaps. In other words, what I want to suggest is that even though we no longer see in front of us a gender system with rigid rules, we do in fact have such a system built into our heads. It's the effort to change that gender system, whatever that system was, because I'm certainly not suggesting it's an unchanging system. It's the effort to change that system which has undergirded women's struggle for equality in the 20th century. Now. Take you back historically, early part of the 20th century. Um, and I've been asked to talk about the 20th century, so I'm going to start there, though I could start anywhere in the 19th century. And I could certainly start in 1848. Some of you know about the Declaration of Sentiments and the, uh, you know, the assertion by women that they too uh, had certain inalienable rights. And you've read about what they thought those inalienable rights were in 1848. Those women struggled to change their gender system. So in the late 19th century, the struggle to change the gender system 
was a struggle to think about how women might live generally within the family. In other words, if you think about it, sure, suffrage was on the agenda, but not fully on the agenda till after the turn of the century. In the 19th century, the big struggle for women was for what we call women's rights. Rights to divorce, rights to keep for married women who work to keep their own wages, rights for custody of their children, rights for married women to hang on to and control their own property. Those were the big issues of the 19th century. Now comes the 20th century. Now, go back to our original assumption. E equality is the capacity to participate in the society. Women are struggling to change a gender system which inhibits participation in certain kinds of ways and encourages participation in other kinds of ways. So beginning of the 20th century, we're going to look at three categories uh, in which women are struggling to make change. And I'm, uh, I hate to do this, but I'm starting with a man. T.H. <laughs> um, Marshall is a British social philosopher and theorist. And uh, in uh, 1948, he came up with a theory which has been enormously influential for uh, historians, sociologists, and so on. Uh, the theory argued, basically, that there are uh, categories of, he called them citizenship, we could call them of equality, that people move through. And he referred to these as civil citizenship, political citizenship, and social citizenship, three categories. And he argued that unless people could participate in all three categories, civil, political, and social, there could be no full citizenship, which we would define as equality or equal citizenship. So political, social, civil first, political, and social. Marshall argued that political, sorry, that civil citizenship was the first category. And that kind of category is uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the freedom to marry, you know, all those things that we, uh, that in the 19th century people didn't, the right to work or the freedom to work, which of course didn't exist for lots of people in the first half of the 19th century. Those were the categories of civil citizenship. Now, Marshall argued that by the end of the 19th century, <coughs> these had mostly been achieved. That is, the ideal, at least not in the reality, that is that everybody expected that people would be free to marry, free to take jobs, uh, f free to be educated, uh, uh, free to uh, speak, free to follow their own religions, and so on. Now pause. By the end of the 19th century, Marshall's British, so he's not referring particularly to the American scene. But when I think about those categories in the American context, I say to myself, well, yes, for some people, at least ideally. Uh, free to work at the jobs that you chose, free to speak. Late 19th century, who isn't free to do those things? Women, Women yeah. but also <laughs> lots of black people, particularly in the South. And that while we espoused those categories, we s had sort of ways of preventing people from achieving full civil citizenship. So you only have to think about lynching in the South, for example, to think, well, some of those categories of preventing people are brutal categories. But women don't get prevented in those ways, but they get prevented in other 
ways, the gender system. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. So how does a woman in the late 19th century, early 20th century, is she, does she have freedom to marry who she chooses? That the so-called freedom to marry, the freedom to work, those were constrained for women, not only by their expectations, but by gender, a gender system which restricted women to certain kinds of jobs, prevented them from earning a living, and so on. Gender system. I was going to say, isn't it also determined by class? Yes. What the needs of your economic and class and gender we sometimes talk about the gender class system. We, we talk now, women's historians, about racialized gender, and we talk about the class and gender system. And in fact, one of the analogies that we could make is to say the following. If I said to you, think about how race functioned in the early 19th, in the early 20th century, to restrict people's options and ideas, you could all think of a zillion ways, right? It's clear that the system was what we now call racist or racialized. If you think about how class functioned in the early 20th century to restrict people's options, go for it. Can you? How does class function to restrict people's options? Is there a class system? So for all that we might talk about freedom to work, what freedom to work meant for a middle or upper middle class married woman was one thing. What freedom to work meant for a poor immigrant you know, woman whose husband might even have deserted her uh, was something else entirely. So <coughs> let, us, let us then uh, move uh, a, a step forward and look at the, at the early 20th century. If by the early 20th century women at least formally had the civil rights that uh, he's talking about, do they have the political rights? And here, the political rights um, are a major issue. By the early 20th century, women had, not all women, some women, had shifted the struggle from civil rights to political rights, and you all know about the suffrage movement. This is Jeanette Rankin, whose name should appear. I don't know why it's not, but it isn't. Uh, uh, this is Jeanette Rankin, who uh, some of you may know was the first woman elected to Congress from the state of Montana. The western states had given women suffrage by the early part of the 20th century. About six states had given women the vote. But the eastern states um, uh, had adamantly refused. You may or may not know that New York State gave women suffrage in 1917, which is a couple of years before the national suffrage amendment. The political uh, effort to get equality for women <coughs> begins in the early 20th century. Uh, rank, uh, we're going to come back to Rankin. Oh, you see, there's, <laughs> there's her name. I don't know why it suddenly appeared. Um, and it, uh, it emerged largely out of a major campaign for women to get the vote. Now, I want you to think a little bit about the notion of political equality. The early 20th century thought about it in terms of suffrage, immigrants preventing blacks from voting at the polls in the South, women, uh, they wanted political equality for themselves. Uh, 
And if you notice, I don't know whether you can see clearly here, these women who are uh, uh, campaigning, this is about 1906, demanding justice, uh, are all dressed very, you know, still floor-length clothes, cloaks over their uh, uh, clothes. They're very proper women. Most of them are wearing hats, uh, although a few are not wearing uh, hats. They're asking for suffrage on the ground that women should be equal to men. We demand justice. Men have the vote, women don't have the vote. Now there's an argument against that which lots of women uh, uh, and men absorb. Here's a cartoon. Uh, this actually comes from the 1919 campaign to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And you'll notice the shift in gender roles here. The woman is wearing the pants and smoking the cigar, and the guy, well, he's got frilly pants on. Uh, Boo-hoo, I'm going back to father. So they've switched roles. That's the argument against giving women the vote. Giving women the vote will destroy the family. And the assumption, gender system, is that within the family, men should still wear the pants, that men should still dominate, that it's part of the natural order that that should be the case. And so shifting a political right threatens what you might call a civil right, not just the right to marry, but the right to have a family which accords and participates in the norms of society. Women got around this in the early part of the 20th century by finding devious ways to participate in the political system. In the 19th century, they'd found devious ways by signing petitions and sending them off to Congress one after the other. In the 20th century, those devious ways take the form of participation in local institutional politics. Part of it in municipal politics, all those famous reform movements of the progressive period, you all teach about those. Many of those, including the social settlement movements, the municipal reform movements, and so on. All of, not, not all of those, and not all of them everywhere, but many of them incorporate, are dominated, are indeed led by women. And I don't have a picture of Jane Addams here, but is that name familiar to you? She's always the one who is uh, cited as part of this. And one way to think about those women is to think about them as uh, uh, sort of shadow politicians. That is, they are pushing and part of the political system. Many of those women march in these parades, but others of those women refuse to march in those parades. Their argument is not that women should have equality because they're human beings, they should be able to work, I'm sorry, they should be able to vote because they are equal to men, but rather that women should be able to vote because they are different from men because they would bring to the polity aspects of womanhood, morality, virtue, no more corruption, uh, that women are particularly good at. In other words, it was precisely the appeal to women's gender roles that in the end, because it is that argument that in the end gets them the vote, that in the end succeeds. It's the argument not that women are equal, but that women are different. We will make politics better because we are women. Now, that was a great argument, and it worked. It got women's suffrage for women, but
and there's a big butt here, it had flaws because immediately the question arose as to which women, which women would make politics better? Well, not black women, you know, African-American women, they're poor, they're uneducated and so on. So let's figure out how to exclude them from the campaign. And if you look at the faces here, you won't see, well, it's, you probably can't see the faces anyway, but you won't see any black faces because the suffrage movement, which was meant to be a movement for equality, excluded African-American women. Immigrant women participated in the suffrage movement, but in some sense as adjuncts. They were more welcome than black women, especially in the North, but they weren't really welcome. So whereas these women marched as part of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, immigrant women, particularly trade union leaders among them, tended to organize in separate suffrage associations, the women's um, uh, equality leagues. Now I'm inserting all these problems. Not to say that the achievement of the vote was not itself an enormous movement towards equality, but to say that it is a complicated uh, movement. Here's the argument. We want the vote to stop the white slave traffic, sweated labor, and to save the children, right? We're not going to have anything to do with the things that men are concerned with, like tariffs and taxes and, you know, we care about women's issues. Familiar argument? Yeah? Yeah? Remember all those attacks against Hillary Clinton? Uh, you know, because she wasn't a proper woman? That was the argument. And here's a woman haranguing men and defending herself. This is, this is the, the um, uh, classic portrait of a woman exercising her freedom of speech. Uh, this is the West. Women vote on equal terms with men. Why not in Oregon? But notice all these states are Western uh, states. And here's the headquarters of the National Association opposed to women's suffrage. And although there are five men staring into the window, that National Association was sponsored, run, created by women, not by men. So the argument divided women uh, among others. I'm going to turn to the flappers in a minute, so I'll leave them on the board so that you can enjoy them. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Marshall's, um, uh, Marshall's argument for um, a political uh, representation takes full force in the early part of the 20th century. Women get the vote and the rest of the story perhaps you know, which is that having got the vote, it turns out that women vote just like men vote. They vote just like their families. That the one major initiative that women adopt in the 1920s, the so-called Shepherd Towner Act, which provides uh, for uh, the federal government to fund health care clinics for uh, uh, infants and mothers of infants, in the 1920s lasts from 1920 to 1927 and then it uh, disappears. Uh, that women's uh, political representation, as you know, is still, well, I looked up some figures before I came this morning and I discovered that uh, there had been over the years, over the course of the years, exactly 260, 260 women in Congress and the Senate for the entire span of American history. Of those 260, 22 served in the Senate and the rest in the House of Representatives and some overlap. That is, there are about eight women who move from one place to the other, so they're counted twice. Uh, 
and that uh, of the current, do you, does anybody know the numbers of women in the uh, House of Representatives and the, no, no. So 535 women in the Senate and the House total, 66 of them are, uh, sorry, 535 representatives and senators, 56 of them are, um, 66 of them are female. And uh, a dozen of those are in the Senate and the rest are in the, in the House. N not a very encouraging number. I looked up the numbers of women who'd served in the cabinet. So here's an interesting figure. Until 1973, when the women's movement ha was already well underway, only two women, only two women had ever served in a cabinet position in the United States. First was Frances Perkins. Yeah, and who was the other one? Ovita Kulp Hobby, Secretary uh -huh. of Education under President Eisenhower. That, that uh, more than two-thirds of the female cabinet members total, there are 40 throughout the span, two-thirds of them are Clinton, Bush II, Obama appointees. That tells you something about political equality. So we got the vote. Did we get political equality? I'm going to put that on the table for just uh, um, a minute. And I'm going to turn to the third uh, question. Marshall told us that by the 1920s, political equality pretty much existed throughout the United States. And I argue the way that we argue for civil equality, yes, there was formal equality, but there was still political discrimination. Women could not serve on juries in most states, and when they served on juries, they couldn't serve on them in the same ways men did. Uh, they could vote, but in some states they had to pay a poll tax. Uh, in others, they were exempt from the poll tax, even though men had to pay a poll tax, so they voted under different circumstances. Uh, they uh, 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 could not assume positions of power in the way that men could assume them, that it was assumed that they would not move them. So. They had formal political equality, but contra Marshall, they didn't yet have what one might call real political equality. So civil equality, political equality, maybe. What about social equality, Marshall's third category? Now, Marshall argued by the middle, or by the 1920s and 1930s, that even if, you, even if there was formal political equality, it could not actually be practiced, he said, unless there was something called social equality. And that's a simple argument, right? If people are starving to death, what good is the ballot to, to them? Uh, if uh, they don't have access to reasonable education, they're not going to be able to vote independently the old Jeffersonian argument and so on. So said Marshall, by the 1920s and 1930s, most democratic countries, and certainly the US, was ready to turn to this question of social equality. And you all know that the depression in the United States fostered that kind of turn to social equality, the insistence that ordinary people should have a kind of social, what we would now call a social safety net, what in 1935 was called social security, generically. That was the name of the whole bill in 1935. And that that would provide uh, social security. Uh, that would provide the social basis that would enable everybody to participate. So instead of having unemployed people marching on the streets, they would feel as though they could go and exercise their vote in the ballot box. And by voting for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they could get the voice that they felt they needed.
Well, what's involved in social citizenship or social equality? As you now know, there are all kinds of things involved in it. And if we take just our own Social Security Act, uh, the U.S. has a more limited definition of these social rights than most other nations, but let's, we're in the U.S., so let's take the U.S. If we take just our own Social Security Act, what's involved in social uh, equality? Well, what's involved is access to education for everybody. How do you ensure everybody has access to education? Uh, you not only uh, build the schools and make them available, but you make sure that kids can afford clothes to go to school or shoes to put on their feet in the winter or textbooks to uh, uh, the textbooks that they need in the schools. So in other words, you expand the system of public education to involve what we now assume. We now assume, you know, breakfasts and lunches for poor kids because how can you possibly learn anything unless you, your stomach is full? So that's the beginning then of a kind of social or one phase of social equality. But there are more than that. In the workplace, unemployment insurance constitutes one basis. So it's one thing to say people have a right to a job. That's part of the civil rights. It's another thing to say that if they don't have that job at any given moment, there should be sufficient income to support them till they get the next job. Because if there isn't, you'll have a riot or a revolution. In other words, political equality won't be real. So unemployment insurance became part of that social system. Pensions for old people, uh, you know, uh, great. Everybody has a right to work and everybody has a right not to starve. Those are civil rights that people agree to. But how do you enforce the right not to starve for old people who no longer have jobs? Some are lucky and they have families to support them. Now the government steps in and constructs a mandatory system of old age insurance so that people not only have the right not to starve, they have the social mechanisms or the wherewithal not to starve. Now these things appear on the surface, and there are lots of others like that, which I'll talk about in a minute. But these things appear on the surface to be gender neutral. Right? Old age pensions? In fact, when you look at how they work and how they operate, they turn out to have the gender system incorporated in them. Uh, many of them are based on the assumption that women belong in families and the benefits are distributed through the heads of families almost all male in those days, and if not male, almost all assumed to be male, so that even when women are heads of families, they're not counted as such. Uh, so if the benefits are distributed through families and through the male heads of families, then women get residual benefits or none at all. So, and I bet you didn't know this, when the Social Security system, what we now call old age insurance or Social Security, was first enacted in 1935, it covered about 50% of the working population. And of that 50%, about 92% were male because it only covered people who worked at certain kinds of jobs and, where they, and who worked regularly at those jobs. Now that excluded most women who, even when they worked for a living, which lots of them did, often worked irregularly or they worked at the wrong kinds of jobs. The result was that the Social Security system covered the families of male heads of households, primarily.
It took until 1939 before the social security system began to cover wives. So men got pensions under social security if they died. <laughs> Tough luck, right? Uh, the woman and her children were left without social security pensions. After 1939, the, the law changes and men get benefits for their wives. Benefits don't expand for women who are in the wage labor force. They do expand for men and the wives of men. Now, you could ask that question. You could say equality, fairness. Surely women are not equal with men under those circumstances. But is it fair in a society in which, after all, most of the livings of families are earned by men? In the Depression period, when women are starting to go out into the wage labor force in large numbers, counterintuitively, because men were losing their jobs, and just like in the current Depression, in an occupationally segregated labor force, the jobs that were coming online in the Depression, in the government, in administration, in teaching, in public services, and so on, tended to be jobs that women could fill. The proportion of women in the labor force remained steady and even increased a little bit, even as men declined. Now, social equality. We have, beginning in the 1930s, legislation that makes it easier for people to participate because there's a floor under them. And a whole chunk of that floor, in fact, covers women, makes lives better for everybody, including women. But differentially, it makes lives much better and participation much easier for men than it does for women. I don't want to make this into a competition. I just want to demonstrate how the gender system is working here. Now, you again, I want to step back and say equality. There's another complication here, and this could be one of the puzzles that you might want to work on after the break. Uh, uh, the, the war, of course, pulled women into the wage labor force. Uh, the social security system expanded to include wives and surviving children. People were getting killed during the war. Wives and surviving children were drawing uh, benefits and the federal government needed more people to contribute to the system. Are women included because anyone's concerned about the equality of women? No. Are they included because the whole system would benefit if there were more workers paying into it? Yes. So, you know, watch out for the meaning of equality here. But let's move on, because I see that our time is rapidly running out. So we are now at a period where formally there is civil, social, and political, uh, civil, political, and social equality. Uh, but as we see, the gender system still governs the distribution of the, of the benefits under each of those rubrics so that women may or may not have real or practical equality under them. And since the gender system is governing, we can assume that they don't. By the 1950s, now World War II, women enter the labor force, and you all know those statistics of how women enter, then they're kicked out of the labor force. But the kicking of women out of the labor force does not end the picture. By the 1950s, there are rumblings of discontent. And I know that we all teach the 1950s as the decade of the family, right? The decade of prosperity, the decade when everybody starts to move into the suburbs. And all that, of course, is the case. Uh, 
But I want to ask a different set of questions, and it's a quest set of questions about what that does to issues of equality. And what I want to argue is that the 1950s raise yet a fourth category of equality, which I want to call economic equality. That is, it makes it clear. Marshall had said, there's not going to be any fair or real participation of everybody until, uh, until social equality is achieved. But by the 1950s, people had begun to understand that economic equality would be necessary to create real participation in the society. What do we mean by economic equality and why the 1950s? Not hard. First, there's the war. The war which pulls women into the labor force, kicks them out of the labor force, and sends them back into the home, but leaves a lot of people wondering whether well, you know, women could do the job then. Why can't they continue to work? Well, we managed to take care of the children during the war. Why can't we continue to take care of the children after the war? Well, women managed to uh, work and run their households and earn incomes during the war. And a lot of women are saying, my God, it was very nice to have my own income. Yeah, I missed my guy, but you know, I liked having my own income. I liked being able to control my... So that's point one. Point two, the GI Bill indirectly and the expansion of education. The GI Bill makes it possible for men, not women, uh, because most women, even those who were in the armed services in one way or the other, didn't benefit from it. But, but it makes it possible for men to go get college educations. But guys with college educations want to marry women with college educations. So women, as well as men, begin to flood into schools. And by the mid and late 1950s, there's a whole cohort of educated, you know, upwardly mobile, working class and middle class women who are sitting on their skills and their educations, and maybe they work for two, three, five years teaching school. Uh, but generally, you know, then they have babies, and then that's it. They're itching to get back into the labor force. Third category, third phenomenon. All these suburban houses that men and women are moving into together in this age of marriage and family are expensive. You might be able to buy a Levittown house for less than $5,000, and that would be wonderful. But you had to furnish it, and you had to have a car to get from here, there, to somewhere else. And you, uh, you had to be able not only to send your children to the local schools, which might be free, but then on to college afterwards you began to need another income. It was no longer possible to imagine that a family could be supported by a single male bread winner, which had been the ideal before. Two income families required women out in the workforce. Point four, once women start moving into the workforce, well, okay, my generation, we moved in. What, what were we? You know, we, we taught school, but we couldn't become principals. We were secretaries, but we couldn't become bosses. Uh, and we certainly couldn't imagine ever running a corporation. Uh, we were, um, uh, you know, well-educated college grads, but we still couldn't go to medical school, law school, architecture school. The professional schools were all closed to us and most of the graduate schools discriminated against women. And so suddenly there's a kind of discontent there. Hey, you know, I'm in the workforce, you know, I'm as good as that guy, I'm watching that guy get promoted over my head. What's going on here? Don't I deserve some measure of economic equality? Those are the major factors for the 1950s. And then the 1950s is followed by the 1960s. Now, you've got this cohort of the people 
Betty Friedan calls the feminine mystique, you know, roiling discontent within the family and the household. At the same time, you still have men being manly, saying, I can support my wife. I can support my children. I don't want my wife going out to work. The measure of manliness in the war years was fighting in the war. The measure of manliness in the 1950s is one's capacity to support a family. And now women are challenging that for their own reasons. And men are discovering they actually need to have the income of women. Result? rising divorce rates, rising divorce rates in the 1960s. And you'll never guess, but it isn't women who are leaving the families, it's men who are abandoning the families in large numbers of cases. And they're abandoning the families because families are challenging their capacity to be real men. Gender system. I need to know when the, the notion that a woman's duty was to give up her job so that she wasn't taking away a job from a man. I know that that, that sort of cultural requirement floats up during you know, like the World War I period and whatever, that that's kind of the idea. Yes, you work while your man is away, but when he comes home, it's a woman's duty not to take a job away from a man, because a man, of course, is going to be ready. So my household. favorite question, <laughs> and, and I, I hate to sort of tout this, but the first, <laughs> the first chapter of this book, which is about 20th century America, is about, uh, it's called The Right to Work, Who Has It and Who Doesn't. And the argument in this chapter is that not only do women work in fairly large numbers, you know, 25% of the industrial labor force is female in 1900, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, and not only do they contribute to family income, but they have no right to work, that is. That the assumption is that they will quit work when they marry, uh, that's 1900. By 1920s, uh, they'll quit work when they have babies. There's a little more leeway uh, in there. In the 1930s, they're driven, uh, they, well, their ide the ideology is women should stay home to make room for men in the wage labor force. But in fact, the wage labor force is so sex segregated that if women stayed home, those jobs wouldn't get done. That is, there, are, there weren't enough men qualified to type typewriters or to do the kinds of secretarial jobs uh, that were necessary, and there weren't enough industrial jobs to reabsorb the unemployed men. In the 1940s, the ideology reversed itself very rapidly, but in a limited way. That is, the ideology then was, we need you in the labor force. And hold on, I actually have some. So we're passing right through the 1920s. Um, uh, hold, here we go. Oh, it's, we're still in the 1920s. Uh, there's Anzia Yazierska. Hold on, hold on. I'm getting you to the 19. Um, <clears throat> 30s, of which she is part. He is an unemployed uh, line. This is Dorothea Lange's famous, and this is Frances Perkins. But I'm looking for the 19. Uh, that's Roosevelt signing now. Uh, here we go. Uh, in the 1940s, there's this propaganda campaign to get women out into the wage labor force, <coughs> but not mothers with children. I mean, even though we need the mothers with children, the argument is uh, always uh, that it's the single women and the women here. Now, look at this one. I don't know if you can see this. I'm proud my husband wants me to do my part, is the caption. I'm proud my husband wants me to do my part. And that's the point, that women are going to work not for themselves, not for selfish ends, not for their families even, but for the country, for the nation.
save the nation. And when the nation doesn't need them anymore, they get kicked out and, well, I won't show you more. They get kicked out of the labor force or asked to leave the labor force. In the 1950s, the ideology is uh, women at home, you know, men supporting their families, male breadwinners, and indeed, the 1950s is one of the few decades in American history, it's the only one I can think of offhand, in which a single male breadwinner could support a family. That is, you know, if you look at average wages and so on in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, there was no way a working class man could support a family on a single wage. But in the 1950s, wages had gone up enough, the social security net had been spread enough so that it was possible, not for all people, not at all for all places, but technically that could happen. It's in the 1960s that that begins to reverse itself. And, you know, we've just done the 1950s, so look at what's going on in the 1960s. There is, you know, we've, we've got this sort of rampant uh, sort of discontent that grows out of what Betty Friedan calls the feminine mystique. But we've also got, by the early 1960s, the rise of the civil rights movement. What does that have to do with women, you say, as you, you know, scratch your head? Well, the civil rights movement provides a model of individual mobility, of the possibilities, because it argues that everybody should get jobs or housing or be able to vote on the basis of individual merit not on the basis of skin color. Women pick up that argument and begin to say, why can't I get a job on the basis of my individual merit? And you will notice, or I will notice, or I will give you evidence if you want it later, that when the women's movement finally gears itself up, in 1965, 66, and 67, now the National Organization for Women is founded in 1966, it does so on the model of the civil rights movement. That is, the civil rights movement is the model that it adopts. There's more evidence that I can uh, give you of that. Then probably the best piece of evidence comes out of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, if you don't know, you should record in your memories and teach to all your students this, oh, I can't do it, but Title VII, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, is the provision of the Civil Rights Act that forbids discrimination on the grounds of, in, sorry, that forbids discrimination in employment. It covers employment only on the basis of race, national origin, religion, uh, as one other category, and sex. First time under the 14th Amendment that sex is inserted into a provision. Now that's 1964, and it is the Civil Rights Bill. And it shouldn't surprise you to know, again, back to equality, that the insertion of sex into that bill, there's lots of controversy about it, and we can talk about that a little later, but the interesting thing about the insertion of sex into that bill is that it was opposed, opposed, by African-American civil rights leaders, both male and female. And it was opposed by them because, after all, this was a civil rights bill. And people didn't really understand gender system. People didn't really understand that women should have rights to work. After all, women were family members. Families supported women. They shouldn't have individual rights. They were not, gender was not analogous to race. 
is what was argued. They didn't use the word gender then, but sex was not analogous to race. And there is a moment when a wonderful woman, I'm sorry, I'm just skipping through all these working, uh, 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 here's the 1950s, but I want to get to, um, uh, here she is. Her name is Pauli Murray. And she's a black feminist, civil rights, civil liberties lawyer who becomes involved in the women's movement in the early 1960s and in the end ends up uh, uh, writing the article that becomes the defense of that 1964 civil uh, rights uh, um, uh, act or the inclusion of sex in that uh, Civil Rights Act. It's an article about the equivalence between Jane Crow and Jim Crow. Now, put yourself back in the 1960s. Here, for the first time, is the emergence of the idea that putting women into separate jobs, not giving them seniority in unions, refusing to promote them, not making them principals in schools, is called discrimination. It had not been imagined as discrimination earlier. It is now beginning to be imagined as discrimination. 1964, beginning of the process. And that's fueled and accompanied by, I mean, I don't think, or do I have to tell you the rest of the story? The 19, uh, 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 early 1960s um, uh, experience of the Students for a Democratic Society and the New Left, which typically, you know, sort of uh, dismisses women. You know, the women make the coffee, uh, uh, the uh, the guys do all the real work. Well, the women are putting their bodies on the line just the way the men are, and they begin to rebel and see themselves as. Uh, being exploited. The uh, anti-war movement which arises in that period and which challenges gender roles on both sides, you know, the big slogan of the women's uh, movement which is, uh, um, uh, what was it, women say yes to men who say no. Um, you know, there's a, you know, encapsulated uh, a challenge against the gender system, right? Don't go to war, right? We think you're more manly if you don't go to war than if you do go to, go to war. And, and um, you know, on top of that, a sexual liberation movement uh, among uh, men and women, but particularly affecting women, which is, some people say, fueled by the invention of the pill. Uh, 1960, 1961 was the release of the pill. We're now right in the 50th anniversary of that, so people not worrying about birth control anymore. Uh, the availability of jobs for women for the first time, large numbers of educated women moving out of their homes and becoming truly independent sexual liberation, a cultural revolution. Remember? Uh, well, you don't remember. I remember. This was part of my, you know, uh, uh, you know, everybody attracted to going to live in communes. Uh, uh, middle class women, uh, you know, claiming welfare benefits because after all they didn't need men to support them anymore. That has, its, has another set of equality consequences. But here, in short, is a, what you might call a revolutionary moment when the ideology of who a woman is or should be, when the gender system is fundamentally challenged. It should be no surprise to you that by the 1970s there was a backlash and that the backlash came from people we now think of as the new right. People who say, hey, wait a minute, the family, the family, tradition, order, that's the backlash. And women, feminists like me, saying individual rights individual capacity to be um, 
uh, to work, to be supported on our own merits. That's the struggle which began in the 1970s at the point, at the point when the women's liberation movement was its most effective. Because it's the early 1970s, uh, between 1969 and 1976, you could say 1979 if you wanted to expand it, is when all that legislation gets passed which mandates what we now call equality, and when the Supreme Court decisions get uh, put into effect, uh, the Supreme Court decisions, and I can run them down for you, but I won't write this minute, um, which, uh, for example, give women equal powers to be executives of an estate, give women in the military equal rights to benefits as men in the military, which give female recipients of Social Security the same benefits as male recipients of Social Security, which provide <coughs> that pregnancy shall be covered under uh, insurance policies. So when I started to teach, uh, my uh, office mate's wife, my office mate's wife was covered for pregnancy. Um, you know, she could go to the hospital and have a baby under the insurance, school's insurance. I wasn't covered because <coughs> I was a worker. Wives were covered, but not workers. <coughs> um, family, you, do you see what I mean? In other words, when the assumption shifts that Benefits or equality comes not through families but through individuals. Then you have a yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. <coughs> I should stop. Yeah. Um, then you have um, the the uh, uh, conflict, the gender role system in conflict. So, okay, I, I will pause there because although there are lots of details in the middle of that, the point that uh, needs to be made here is, is the following. Now, I started out by saying I'm a feminist. There's no question but that I think that human equality will be expanded by the expansion of individual rights to everybody who deserves them. But that's not what a lot of people think. I don't know what you think, and I'm not going to ask. But it's a perfectly legitimate position to say, wait a minute, the family is the basis of social order. The family is how we've organized our lives. And so maybe this thrust of women for individual rights undermines the efforts of families to create a responsible, rational, socially ordered system. And if that's so, then is my struggle for equality selfish? Is it merely self-interested? Is it designed to move me forward at the cost of the well-being of all of us? And that's the question I'm going to leave you with for the break. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you very much.